Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to talk a little bit about some of our recent research. Uh, my lab works on the human oral microbiome and the human oral microbiome database uh, now has about 788 distinct taxa from 19 different phyla shown here that exist in the oral cavities of humanity. So it's an extremely diverse environment. And in fact, in the human body, the oral cavity is second only to the gut in terms of overall microbial diversity. Uh, however, unlike the gut, most of the bugs in the oral cavity have been grown in the lab, about two thirds of them. Uh, we have lots of different sequenced genomes and there are a wealth of omics studies uh, looking at various states of health and disease. The problem is uh, a large percentage of genes and, and proteins uh, in all of this data have putative or unknown functions. Uh, I know from my own experience, a lot of the putative genes uh, are actually misannotated by, by software that annotates a lot of these genomes. And a lot of this problem is actually a function of the fact that very few microbiome species have really been studied uh, at the genetic level. So for a while, my lab has been uh, working on creating new genetic systems for organisms of interest that we find in these different types of omic studies. And to create a genetic system, uh, really the first key, in fact, rate limiting step really is, is how you transform these organisms. This is often the most challenging part of any genetic system. And the approach we like to take is using natural competence, uh, which is sometimes synonymously referred to as natural transformation. But basically all this means is bacterial mediated DNA uptake. So the bacteria do all the work. They, they produce the proteins to grab DNA from the environment, internalize it, and potentially recombine that DNA with their genomes. It's very simple to administer in the lab. Uh, it can be extremely high efficiency. The problem is it's very difficult to predict the appropriate growth conditions that will trigger an organism to induce this ability. And in fact, right now, there's a very small number of bacteria that are known to be naturally competent. So the question is, is this actually a rare ability? Uh, my bias is that actually this is quite common among bacteria. Um, and we just don't know the conditions in which to induce this ability. Uh, but because I have this bias, we're willing to test a lot of uh, unusual organisms for natural competence. And so the bug we'll talk about today, uh, the most recent organism we've created a genetic system for is called Parvomonas micro. This is a classic pathobiont. Uh, it's very highly abundant in mucosal dysbiotic diseases, uh, many of them. And in fact, it's also one of the most common organisms you'll find inside of malignant tumors. So all of our infection biology studies, all of our isolates, we go directly to patient samples and really use classic old school microbiology to target the organisms that we're after from these samples. Uh, and in fact, uh, like I said, the latest Parvomonas, here's an image of what its biofilm looks like. So Parvomonas comes from the Tissierale class of the Firmicutes. These group of organisms are classic microbial dark matter. This entire class is uncharacterized. Um, and in fact, even the phylogeny is a problem for these organisms. Uh, if you do 16S studies and you happen to get Parvomonas, like in this study we did, Oftentimes, those pipelines that annotate uh, the phylogeny is incorrect, which is incorrectly labeling Parvomonas as a clostridial organism. These are fastidious obligate anaerobes, very challenging to grow, uh, definitely challenging to isolate from mixed patient samples. And not surprisingly, they're basically uncharacterized and assumed to be genetically intractable. Well, how we want to test for natural competence, we, we have a, a system that kind of goes like this. If you plate your organisms on media supplemented with rifampicin, we like to use rifampicin because a single point mutation in the uh, RPOB gene encoding uh, the beta subunit of RNA polymerase will make these organisms resistant to this antibiotic. And once you have a resistant isolate, uh, you have a source of transforming DNA you can use for antibiotic selection. 
So we did that in Parvomonas and uh, found a, a typical mutation that confers resistance to rifampicin. Now to test natural competence, this is the system that we've come up with that so far has been quite effective. We have our transforming DNA. This is isogenic with the original parent strain. You spot the DNA on an auger plate, then take your test organism, spot it right on top of the DNA, let that grow there for a day or more, depending on the growth rate of the organism. You scrape it off a non-selective plate and replate it on antibiotic media. You can test and see if there's any transformants. And in fact, most of our isolates of Parvomonas, including the ATCC strain, do have various levels of natural competence that we could detect, uh, except for this A1 strain, uh, this clinical isolate. So the next question we have is, are these genetically tractable? And so to do that, uh, we wanted to insert an antibiotic cassette on the chromosome. Uh, we like to use cloning independent mutagenesis. All that means is we create all of our constructs solely by PCR and transform PCR products. Uh, sometimes use Gibson assembly for the same thing. And in our clinical isolate A28, indeed, we could find uh, insertion of this antibiotic cassette and in fact, all of our other isolates that exhibited natural competence, we could do the same thing, except for that A1 strain. So we wanted to now test if we make different constructs with different amounts of homology, how does that affect its ability to transform? As a general rule, most people use about one KB of flanking homology to make to target mutagenesis constructs. Uh, however, and for Parvomonas, if you increase that homology to two and a half KB on either side of the antibiotic cassette, we can increase its transformation rate by two orders of magnitude. And in fact, uh, if we take this larger construct, even our previously untransformable strain A1 now uh, is also transformable, albeit at a much lower rate than the other strains. But the bottom line is every isolate of Parvomonas that we have is transformable using PCR products. So now we wanted to uh, try actual mutagenesis. And for this, we like to target RecA. Uh, if you have an organism, you know nothing about it, RecA is a wonderful first gene to delete because it's highly conserved, it's not essential, and it has uh, very predictable phenotypes. And that one of the most common ones is going to be that uh, if you knock out Rec A, you should not be able to transform the organism again. And that's what's shown here. And we can actually complement this mutation back to the wild type levels by taking this open reading frame and inserting it on another place on the chromosome uh, in this same strain. And in fact, you can recapture that, uh, that natural competence you can also test for genotoxicity with organism or, uh, chemicals like mitomycin C that are very damaging to DNA, especially if you don't have Rec A. You see about three orders of magnitude difference uh, unless you complement that mutation. So the bottom line here is that we have all the typical phenotypes you would expect from a Rec A mutant. And in fact, we can even genetically complement those uh, by transforming PCR products and ectopically expressing that same open reading frame. So we don't even need a, a, a shuttle plasma to do genetic complementation. We wanted to create a reporter strain for this, and we like to use green ranilla luciferase. This is a synthetic luciferase that we created. Uh, it's extremely bright. And if you insert it downstream of the EF2 gene, this is one of the most highly expressed genes in almost all bacteria, and it's constitutive. So we insert our reporter after EF2, and indeed we get a signal that's five orders of magnitude above background signal, which is extremely robust, and it's highly precise. We can dilute that reporter down to about somewhere between 100 to 1,000 total cells and accurately quantitate that all in a clinical isolate. To create a tunable gene expression system for inducible gene expression, uh, we tried a couple things and actually what worked the best is using post-transcriptional regulation instead of transcriptional. So for this, we have the theophylline riboswitch. This is just a little RNA element that you can stick in the five prime UTR of any gene. 
and determine whether that uh, gene will be translated. And so we, we mutated this riboswitch to something we call the Theo plus riboswitch to make it actually work a little better. And we can get a 70 fold dynamic range of inducibility depending upon how much theophylline we add. Theophylline is just a, a, a small molecule that's non-toxic from the, the xanthine family. So it looks a lot like a nucleotide. And lastly, we wanna see, can we do transposon mutagenesis in our, in our clinical isolate uh, with an eye to eventually doing TNC? And so this is all in vitro transposon mutagenesis using the HIMAR and Magellan system. And as shown here, we can get 6,000 transposon mutants per microgram of genomic DNA. And at this level of mutagenesis, this is already directly suitable for, for TNC-seq analysis. So the takeaway message here is even wild clinical isolates of microbial dark matter may be suitable for detailed molecular genetics research. So if you have an organism that you're interested, uh, I would highly encourage you to go for it. And I thank you for your attention.